what four things didn't help you? That might be a little easier. This turned out in the end when the analysis to be like, wow, they described it all over the place. Um, so the methodology for this particular study, there was no question that this was a qualitative study. I wanted to talk to people doing what they were doing. I didn't go into the classrooms. I wasn't necessarily where they were doing the work. Um, but this was no question a qualitative study. The interpretivist, constructivist research paradigm really was the place where we could hear, and I said that, <laughs> I said it, we could really hear the teacher's experience. That, that was the framework that would allow the teacher's experience to get in and also allow me to join them in making meaning of what their experience was. So that was, that was a framework that sat around the entire study. Um, and then the data collection methods. I did individual face-to-face semi-structured interviews, um, which were a blast. That was the best part of the study. Was really I, now I'm doing. Now I'm sitting with these ten people, and we're talking about the thing they're very passionate about. So that was really fun. And everyone filled out a demographic data sheet so we could know who was there. Um, the participants came from attendance lists from this learning to achieve training that that other slide came from. I had um, become a trainer for this training about adults with learning disabilities across the southern half of the state of Maine through much of 2010. And when I, really, when I wanted to go out and talk to people, I thought, you know, it'd be good to talk to, some, to people who've had even this, it was a day-long training, just this, this spit, if you will, of, of information that was meant to be cutting-edge information about this topic. So I went through the um, attendance sheets and basically noted anybody who'd endorsed themselves being a teacher or an instructor in an ABE program. So of those, there were 36, and 10 of those 36 said, I'm up for this. There really was some energy, I thought, in, from, from the local field about someone, someone's got an ear to this, and we really want to be in on it. Um, I won't read this because reading slides is awful, but um, I would just say about the, my group of participants, they probably, no, they, they, they really, they don't represent <laughs> They're a very unusual group of adult basic ed teachers because the vast majority of them actually have full-time positions. Some have benefits in their, in their positions. Um, this part was accurate, nine male, one female. That's pretty much, I think, a broad pattern across the field. I had almost an even split in terms of people who were relatively inexperienced and then very experienced. And uh, the adult ed certification in Maine is an endorsement that you can get on a teacher certification, which typically is a K-12 certification. So if you've become certified to teach math or English at the K-12 level, you can do some three or four additional courses and get an adult ed endorsement um, in Maine. And we had mostly English teachers. And I had to, I had, there were two participants who had been educated as, as K-12 special ed teachers. And in my original idea was to try to see if I could find a whole group of those folks. Like, are there people teaching in adult basic ed who know special ed, who were trained in it? But those are the only um, two maybe who exist in the state of Maine, so it was good to have them anyway. In terms of the, just the trustworthiness and limitations of a qualitative study like this, um, as I said in the beginning, I had to really sort of pay attention to what assumptions was I bringing, and I, and I had a fair number, not the least of which was that I thought occupational therapy had a place in adult basic ed programs. I even, th I even thought I knew exactly what that place was, what it would look like, what we'd be doing. I had a daily schedule all figured out. <laughs> So I had to check that um, ahead of time. I had other assumptions about what the teachers were going to be like and how my sense of them was that they would be sort of intuitive teachers, that they were just figuring things out as they went along. Some of that came from um, the pilot study that preceded this study, was, was that um, thinking that people told me, well, we just figure it out. And right, there's the pilot study. Um, I, so the transcription of the interviews, when you do that yourself, you do hear data again, you hear it a little bit differently. Every single way you can immerse yourself in your data certainly supports um, the trustworthiness. I kept the participants involved at the point of the, um, when the transcripts were done, they all said they would love to see them. They all looked at them and felt they were accurate representations of the conversations that we had. Um, and I also had this term, inter-rater reliability for this study is funny, but three people checked my codes and um, and provided some feedback there. Um, I think the obvious limitation of a qualitative study is the same thing really that supports how great they are, which is that it's about the researcher to a certain extent, to a big extent. 
So some obvious limitations are around my subjectivity in terms of how I interpreted what I heard. Um, I did only solicit the attendees of that training. So I wasn't talking to people who you know, didn't really know much from my view of, of, about learning disabilities. Um, and the, you know, it w there were 10 people. So it was a relatively small sample size. And then it was a very described demographic. So you know, when we'll get to the end about how other studies could go, there are certainly ways that we could capitalize on those limitations to do other studies. This, is such a, this slide is a metaphor for what data analysis is like. This is such a messy, texty slide. This is exactly what the process of data analysis felt like. So I'm not going to, there's no way I'm going to read this. Just let's say that this, I'll only speak to the template approach of trying to get to the themes is where so the researchers, you know, brings what you understand about a field, the, the literature review that you've done, um, any grounds, you know, hands-on experience you've had to, what the, to the data that you're looking at. So there are some, you come with some idea of what you might see, and that's the template that starts that process of going through the transcripts and re reading and reading and rereading transcripts to pull the themes out. The key thing about this um, data analysis process, this is all I'm going to say, <laughs> this book was a godsend. This is the book from which the idea for it, data summary tables and the data summary charts came from. And those were things that really instilled some structure to a process that otherwise feels pretty uh, loose and, and can feel like it's getting away from you. And those were some very structured, concrete things that helped the data start to make some kind of sense and, and led to the findings. <laughs> this, was, this was my research assistant during those very, this was in the, somewhere in the middle of the winter and things were getting very sort of dark. I don't even know if you can really see her very well. She's, black dogs don't <coughs> photograph well, but I had all of the posters laid out on the bed and she was having none of having to be in the way and just got on them. I thought, well, there it is. Uh, so very helpful in trying to get to the findings. And so there were, th there were three major findings because they responded to, I had a central research question and I had two sub-questions. So the three findings really responded to those. The first finding responds to the central question, which, make, which makes it the most robust one. So it had four parts. All 10 participants described their practice, teaching practice um, in the terms of these four themes. And what I've, I'll do next is go through each one of these themes and bring the voices. I've put in some of the, the quotes from the participants so you can hear them. To, uh, they're not going to speak, but you can see them too. Um, they talked about the process of identifying the students' learning disabilities or if they even, if that mattered to them at all. Um, their perceived role and identity as an ABE teacher the specific methods they used, and then ABE system issues that I had half a sense about, but that became actually a rather large theme for folks. How much the macro system of the ABE field and system affected their on-the-ground teaching practice. They were very clear about that. So in terms of identifying the students' learning disabilities, I'm just, I'll let you read these, but there's some um, commonalities. I've picked out the ones that really spoke to things that a lot of people said. Um, there were teachers said that they could notice patterns about students' performance that m started them right off with a red flag, like mm, there's something about the pace that this person's working at, or there's some foundational alphabetics issues that I can see right away when they start to write things down. There's some things that jump right out at me. So their level of sort of assessing right out of the blocks with people was was key. Um, and then and then a couple people spoke to this idea that. Other things in an ABE classroom can look like learning disabilities. And, and this, uh, Jane was particularly clear about the fact that, that people's socioeconomic level was a key element. She said some people have never had access to going to school. They move around so much. They never settle long enough to stay in a school. Or you know, their content learning is broken up by geography and time. And, and she said, and so they come to us, and it's really not a disability per se, but we're going to want to call it that because we don't know how to respond to it. It looks like a learning disability. There's a lot of other things it could be. So that was key. Um, here, in terms of, of how teachers saw their role, it, you know, Deb here at the beginning really talked about how she sees herself as sort of a conduit for people. Like, they need this credential in order to get the job that they're really needing and that they're after. They need at least this high school credential. And so that sometimes, even if I can see how badly somebody's struggling, I'm going to help them move along because I won't, I'm not going to get in the way of them achieving what they want. Um, but clearly she had some angst about that. She could see how that may not be in their best interest at, at the end. Um, and relationship was huge. 
um, for all the teachers, not just Teresa, but she used it in, that, in this particular quote. So uh, they rely, teachers relied on their abilities to engage students in relationships, and it had huge outreach effects in terms of then the assessments that they could do with students, because students trusted them enough to be vulnerable and to show the things that they didn't know or that they did struggle with. The relationship was a thread, a sub-thread through everything for all of the teachers. It was really striking. And then Pam was getting hyped up while she was telling me how hyped up she gets about teaching. There was just this palpable energy, not just from her, she was the most effusive, but all the teachers had a real passion for working with folks. And I think that was the relationship part too, but, but they really saw themselves as sort of a, a, a way for people to go where they wanted to go, and, it, and their role is to help them get there. Um, this is pretty straightforward in terms of the kinds of things that all the teachers could list, very concrete methods and techniques that they used. Um, whether or not they knew they were doing it, they would often say things like, oh, I figure it out, or I'm not really sure, I don't really have any strategies or techniques, but when you listened and you went back and looked again at what they said when you asked them, they were using a lot of very clear strategies and, and often very evidence-based practice. I mean, I think that's a, that's a thing to look at further. How is it that they, how did they know that? How did they know to do what they were doing? Um, and a lot of uh, teachers are now very clear about differentiating their instruction for students. So, and especially ones who had taken some more advanced coursework or training. And that came through clearly too. The, the ABE system issues fell into a couple of categories. Um, probably the key ones were, were funding and working conditions. And I say that like those aren't connected. Those are connected to each other for sure. But the working conditions, they would talk about things like the part-time versus full-time positions. And you know, can people ever really make a career of this? One of my participants worked three part-time ABE jobs um, to make her a full, more than a full position. Um, so there's that full-time, part-time thing. Are we going to get benefits? How, how is the pay? Um, those things were very upfront for people. And that you could work that back to a systems issue in terms of how adult basic ed gets funded. And then that had a clear overlay with the ability to have the time to do the work, um, you know, to, to both do assessments and then use the assessment information to help the student, because isn't that why we're doing that in the first place? The second finding was um, about professional development. And just about everybody, the overwhelming majority of people talked about how valuable they felt professional development was, and again, how impacted that was by the other working, the, the, the funding, the other ABE systems issues. There's no time to go to, to trainings. There's no money. The programs don't pay me to go. They don't pay the fee to go, and they don't pay me the time to go. So teachers end up doing a lot on their own time and a lot of self-directed.